some of the things that we would like to do. Um, let me start by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm presenting today. Um, so today I'm on the land of the Wallamadigal, um, and I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present, as well as any First Nations people who are joining us here today. Let me, um, let me start with this one here, which is um, my disclosures. Um, normally when we do health and medicine um, talks, we often have to put in our disclosures because a lot of people have conflicts of interest. I, I don't have any conflicts of interest that are relevant here today. Um, but while you read through these, just get an idea of, of who I am. Um, I can tell you what I'm gonna do for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, hopefully, so we have plenty of time for questions because I think that's probably the most interesting thing, uh, interesting part of the seminar as well. Um, so I'm gonna skip the definitions of misinformation and a couple of other things and, and quickly go through to an example um, of um, misinformation. Um, then I'm gonna go through some examples that you might, might remember um, from COVID-19. And I'm gonna go through examples that come from research. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the state of misinformation research and then some of the reasons why work we do in the area around the world currently isn't really very useful um, for helping governments, public health organizations, social media platforms, doctors, community, and so on. Then I'm going to end with some work that my teams um, have been doing, um, including Emily, um, to try and do misinformation research better um, and in ways that are more useful. And the reason why I thought I'd start by sharing um, my screen this way, um, so you can see my video on the side, is because I wanted to start with this particular example of misinformation or potential misinformation. Um, and uh, see if we could get uh, get some audience participation in, in this part of the talk. Um, so hopefully we have the annotation tool available at, for you at the top of the screen, might be at the bottom of the screen for you. Um, and I, what I'll do is I'll start by showing you how I'm, I'm gonna use it. And so here's my annotation tool. And what I want you to do is um, uh, go around to the pictures and decide which of the pictures you think has the most um, is the answer to the question on the page. Um, you can see I put my little annotation there in um, with a little red heart right in the middle because um, I haven't chosen which one. But I'd like to ask you, which of these foods have the most iron in them? Um, and as you go ahead and attempt to use the annotation tool, hopefully it's turned on for all of you. I don't um, see it. Does anyone else see it? Oh, does Amina see it? Uh, Amina's uh, got part of her screen. Can you see the word, the word annotate with a pen? No. Uh, I could see whiteboard. Should be able to see annotate with the with the pen. Maybe it's only turned on for me. No, I've got it. I've got it. Oh really? Oh sorry. Okay, I'll <laughs> sorry, just yeah, I my head. See. Can sorry. anyone else? Can anyone else help you direct to see where it is um, on your screen? Maybe if your screen is not big enough, it'll be under more for dot dot dot. Yeah, I can see more, uh, but it says uh, breakout rooms and start focus. Uh, view uh, options, annotate. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Uh, yep, there you go. Uh, for me, it's right on the top of my screen. There you go. So everyone, everyone can do it. Okay. So as you go through and try and figure out how to use the annotate tool and put your little mark or whatever mark you want um, on which of the foods you think have the most iron, um, I thought I'd, I'd tell you about some of the things you want to remember about misinformation. And so the key things about misinformation is that misinformation is still misinformation, even if it's unintentional and there's no intent to deceive. Um, we often think about misinformation together with things like conspiracy theories, which are related to the belief that the powerful people are covering up secrets or powerful organizations are covering up secrets. It's a requirement for something to be a conspiracy theory. Another thing, just because someone is critical of the status quo doesn't always mean they're spreading misinformation because evidence changes. It's possible to say something that's both completely true, um, but harmful as well. And so misinformation always and it isn't always that easy. Okay, so we've now got some answers on the on the board. Um, my one's on there right in the middle, which doesn't help anyone. We've got two votes for chickpeas, and we've got one, two, three, four votes for spinach. And I guess the idea here is that we probably assume this was going to be a trick question, right? And so how many of you have heard about um, spinach being an excellent source of iron? Uh, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, that's, and that's um, mis, 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 misinformation, information. Not quite, Adam. Sorry? Oh, it goes back to Popeye and how I can carry that. Yeah, that's right. So Popeye um, uh, is the one, if, if, if you're as, at least as old as me, I guess, you probably might <laughs> remember Popeye. Um, um, but yeah, Popeye was the one who was chugging spinach and 
and um, and was being especially strong. And so it turns out um, that this might have been a source of misinformation. So the the theory, as the theory goes, that there was this myth that um, uh, when uh, someone was trying to work out how much iron there was in spinach, um, they made a mistake. I actually made an order of magnitude mistake by putting the decimal place um, in the wrong spot. And oh. so they guessed that there was 10 times the amount of iron in, in spinach than, than there actually was. Turns out, actually, that's a myth too, because when someone just knew, heard about this myth and then tra- went and tried to investigate, they could find no evidence of this anywhere on the internet. And so it turns out that we actually have no evidence that the myth even existed in the first place. So no one really knows where the, the, the misinformation came from. But the truth, of course, is that um, of these, um, spinach and kimchi have um, lower amounts of iron and uh, dark chocolate and chickpeas have about the same amount of iron and it's double that of kimchi and spinach. Um, so uh, if you're going to pick these, pick the items based on the amount of iron they have in them, Um, You're better off having chickpeas and chocolate, but probably not together. Um, Okay, so that's an example of misinformation where we kind of don't understand where the the source of it was. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some examples where we kind of do know the source. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to share uh, in a different way. um, Like this. All right. Okay, so you can see me better now. Um, The reason why I didn't do that before was because um, you can't annotate if you can see my picture on the screen. So hopefully everybody can see me um, and then some some pictures around me, right? Yeah, good. All right, very good. So let's move on to um, examples of misinformation from COVID-19. And these are examples where I think we kind of know a little bit about um, where some of the, the misinformation comes from, the source, I guess. What we know is that misinformation can cause harm. We know that misinformation has already caused harm in some unusual ways during the COVID-19 pandemic. So in these cases, what I wanted to point out was that the source of the misinformation potentially um, in these cases appears to be from researchers. It's not to say that the researchers themselves were necessarily at fault, but let's take this first example of hydroxychloroquine and, and start with the harm. So as a very direct example, we noted a couple in the United States ingested fish tank cleaner after reading that it had chloroquine in it and uh, the husband died and the wife was very sick. So in June 2020, it's quite early in the in the pandemic, a research named um, Didier Rayel, um, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, um, was publishing observational study research claiming that treating patients with Uh, hydroxychloroquine led to better outcomes or leads to better outcomes and used causal language there. Uh, The WHO were very quick to recommend a pause on research on hydroxychloroquine, recognizing that there wasn't um, particularly strong good evidence for it. Um, But an Australian trial uh, registered on uh, Australian New Zealand clinical trial registry, um, they held firm on wanting to test um, hydroxychloroquine until they eventually removed the drug from the the trial registration on the 12th of November. So you can actually go back through the trial registration and, and see um, that they had it in there until, until they removed it in November and stopped studying it. So given we're here in Australia, might also be um, sort of familiar with the support that existed for the tra- for, for hydroxychloroquine, um, both from in politics or politicians, I should say, um, as well as certain sections of the media in Australia. And what we know is that false claims from problematic research happened um, and did, and so did the misuse of hydroxychloroquine. It then sort of looked like we didn't quite learn our lesson with that one because um, ivermectin was tested in an Australian trial. And I remember distinctly um, when the study was complete, um, watching the, the media around the trials that were test for testing for ivermectin. And the trial investigators, probably not trained, I guess, were, were not really media savvy enough to be able to avoid um, overhyping ivermectin as a treatment. Um, And we know that there were certain problems with ivermectin, things like shortages and and other kinds of issues related to ivermectin as well. So uh, that's that's one example where where there was misinformation and was kind of started by researchers or there was certainly a source for researchers. All right, so let's move on to our second example. Um, And given the context of this example, you might immediately be able to recognize what this photo is of. Um, it's It's a wet market in Wuhan. Uh, So way back in January of 2020, 
there were some opportunistic researchers that got their hands on the sequencing data. Um, and you know that sequencing data um, was partially shared or helped shared by, by people at the University of Sydney as well. Um, and uh, some researchers got their hands on those data and uh, for the virus, uh, and they ran it through software called BLAST, which is a bioinformatics thing. Um, and they found some matching alignments. As many researchers do, and I'm assuming, of course, none from University of Queensland, certainly none from the University of Sydney, right? Um, they made some interesting choices in the wording of how they presented the results. Um, they wrote things like astonishing relation and uncanny similarity and unlikely to be fortuitous. And of course, the reality was that they were being opportunistic, um, but they didn't really have the expertise they needed because the similarities that they found they were all extremely likely and there was nothing astonishing about them at all. So they ended up retracting that paper, that preprint, um, within just a couple of days. But by then it was too late. Uh, there was a right wing media site called Zero Hedge and they'd already picked it up as a story. And it spread through the media very quickly after that. By March 9th, 2020, um, which is the day that I started my new job at the University of Sydney and before I had a parking spot there, um, this story about, um, about uh, the, the virus being manufactured in a lab in, in, in China um, was being relayed to me or relayed to me via um, the Uber driver um, who drove me to campus. So there isn't evidence that I have to just really show you this. Um, we do know that there is evidence that um, anti-Asian sentiment and in including violence um, increased substantially in 2020 and probably 2021 um, in places all around the world, um, including Australia. And I suspect that this particular piece of misinformation was, um, and it's the way it spread through um, certain sections of the, of the community um, was certainly a, um, how do we say, a convenient excuse for a bunch of kind of scared people to let their inherent racism get the better of them. And so while we can't really say that there's a direct causal link between, you know, um, writing a bad preprint and um, violence, um, those two things certainly happened um, one after the other, I should say. All right, so let's go through and get started in things that relate to AI. Um, and data-driven research in the area. So in the last two examples, um, I showed you uh, that we have a problem with the research that um, where the research itself is potentially flawed um, or and definitely misinterpreted and miscommunicated in the public domain in relation to the pandemic. But we also have, a, we also have some big problems with data-driven and AI-based misinformation research right now. Um, teams that have experience in very specific areas, um, physics, computer science, um, uh, managed to publish studies that people don't read properly, um, and they often assume that the conclusions are correct and appropriate. On the left-hand side here, we have an example of an article published in the American Journal of Public Health uh, in 2018. It has 826 citations as of a week or so ago, um, hundreds of news media articles, um, and an altmetric score that's off the charts. They concluded um, that bots and trolls are eroding public consensus on vaccination. But the problem with that research is they don't actually measure that at all. Uh, they use a biased sample of tweets and compare it to another biased sample of tweets. And they never actually measure whether those tweets are actually seen by people or if they have the potential to impact on public consensus. Uh, my team, including Emily, um, have since shown that seeing these kinds of tweets is extremely rare and that the conclusion is unfounded. On the right, we have something that's quite similar in a way. Um, this is a paper that was published in Nature um, that samples Facebook groups that are explicitly about vaccination in the, you know, they kind of have to have vaccination in the title of the group or the page. So what they're doing is uh, they're, they're sampling or they're, they're looking at a select um, relatively tiny number of vaccine specific groups, pages, just hundreds of them, something like a thousand of them, 700 of them, they're included in the analysis. And what is a tiny proportion of Facebook users and they're ignoring or not looking at mainstream news, public health organizations, celebrities. Those are all excluded from the analysis. And then the claim is that anti-vaccination views will dominate in a decade. They never measured people's views. They just compared the people who joined vaccination specific pages to people who joined other vaccination specific pages, not representative of any population. And when they said views will dominate, they never actually measured those views. So each of these two studies generated thousands of news articles uh, where these kinds of problematic conclusions or misrepresented conclusions um, were passed on without thinking. 
And the thing they have in common is that they sample from social media data badly and they make claims about what people believe and do in the real world uh, without actually connecting data to reliable outcome measures about attitudes, behaviors, uh, or health outcomes. All right, so controversial, I know, but probably true. Um, look at this nice team of people here. So a few years after the work was published in American Journal of Public Health, um, uh, the team that I help look after um, wanted to actually check whether people were likely to see posts from bots um, or if they were likely to see vaccine critical information on Twitter. Uh, what we found was, was quite obvious. Um, just 6% of a random sample of Twitter users from the United States see more vaccine critical information than they see neutral or positive vaccine information. And they almost never see tweets posted by bots. Exposure to bots, for example, is so minuscule that their ability to influence the discourse is practically impossible. Uh, and that's even before we consider what sources people are likely to trust. And I would argue that people are obviously not likely to trust a random bot account, even if they do see the tweet. So this was a big team effort. Um, it included in order, uh, Paige Martin as a software engineer, Didi Surian as a postdoc in machine learning, Emily Dada, who you know very well, Jason Dalmazzo, who's another software engineer, and Marika Steffens, who was a journalist um, with the ABC and then finished a PhD with us um, in communications and social psychology related to vaccination. So look, no doubt if we went back and tested that framework that was proposed in the other paper, the Nature paper that was written by the physicists, we'd probably show a bunch of other kind of obvious conclusions. First of which would be vaccine specific pages and groups aren't the only places where people discuss vaccination about COVID. And second, um, that joining a group or following a page on Facebook doesn't immediately translate into um, refusing to vaccinate or deciding to vaccinate or your particular views or your decisions that you make about vaccination either. And so hopefully this is an example where, um, where I show that multidisciplinary research is kind of useful. So look, if it wasn't obvious based on a previous slide and the, and the title of the talk today, I think the key to solving the issue with issue with these problems in misinformation is exactly that multidisciplinary research. It's exactly the kind of research we do in the department that I lead in the University of Sydney um, called Biomedical Informatics and Digital Health, where we have a really broad range of people, as well as all the teams that I've been sort of like helping or looking after or been part of in the, in the last sort of uh, 15 years or so. So in the previous slides, um, I showed you examples of studies that only examine content and group membership. And those are the ones that sit on the very far left over there. Um, on the far right in blue, um, we have the kind of what I would call a vast literature from social psychology, from health behaviors, from communications. But one of the problems with these studies is that they're often done in smaller cohorts of participants um, as trials and in isolation from the environments that people live in and the communities they seek to join and belong to. Only a small handful of studies manage to connect across this kind of complete spectrum um, between social media and web data that we can access through to those who see the content, the ways they engage with that content and proper health outcome measures. And I guess I'd, I want to stop there and just point out that um, often the kinds of studies that work across the full spectrum um, involve lots of data, um, la very large data sets. And if there's one thing we know about very large data sets is that a lot of them are quite amenable to the use of uh, machine learning methods. And so what I'm going to do is go through a whole bunch of examples where we use machine learning methods um, in these areas. And hopefully um, they're, they're relatively closely related to the kinds of things that I think we should be doing more of as studies in the area related to misinformation. All right. So we're going back uh, in time a little bit now. Um, so people often ask me, um, you know, why does misinformation spread? Um, we know from our two first examples that I showed you about um, misinformation during COVID that it can certainly um, um, be associated with harm. But it can be hard to predict which kinds of misinformation are more likely to spread and often seems quite random. Um, and when people ask me, you know, why does misinformation spread, I always tend to give the same answer. I think a major factor that contributes to not only the spread of misinformation, but the potential for its influence behaviors is about communities. So people want to belong to communities and they're likely to follow along with prevailing attitudes in the communities that they belong to. And this is a study that my team did many years ago now, um, where we looked at the concentration of certain topics within communities. And in this case, we use tweets about HPV vaccines on Twitter, as well as the follower connections between the users who posted about vaccines on Twitter. So we applied two methods. 
Uh, so one's a machine learning method called topic modeling. Um, and that finds natural groups across the content of tweets based on the language that's in them. And the second one, um, we used a method called community structure analysis. Um, community structure analysis traditionally is not machine learning, um, although there are now machine learning methods to do community structure analysis. And community structure analysis finds natural groupings between the users based on the follower connections between them. Um, often when people do community structure analysis on Twitter, um, they use retweet connections because it was easier to access um, uh, tweet information rather than the follower connections. And back when we did this, it was actually extremely hard to collect all these data and we had to have computers and big machines running constantly for multiple years at a time. Okay, so we tested the topics to try and understand how different the topics were from each other. Um, and the way we did that was that we had someone go through an example of like uh, five uh, tweets at a time, four of which came from one topic and one came from another topic. And we asked them, which one is the odd one out? And if they picked that one, then we knew that th those two topics were differential uh, or different enough that you could tell the difference between the, the topics. So um, the, the topics in red, uh, vaccine critical topics such as scandals, conspiracies, side effects, harms, lots of misinformation happening in the red topics. In blue, we have experiential posts that come from teenagers um, who discussed going to get their HPV vaccines and how much their arm hurts. And in green, the informational and pro-vaccine tweets that included things like news media, information on how to get the HPV vaccines, um, often research from about the vaccine in trials or from public health and advocacy and things like that. And we then looked at a distribution of tweets across those communities. And you won't be surprised at all to know that the communities didn't mix very much across the green, the red, the blue. And on the right here, I should say on the right, but sort of above my head and here and, and just there, um, uh, you can see how those communities mixed. Um, so you've got an example of a community who mostly posted in red, a community who mostly posted in, um, in green. But actually the one for me that's kind of the most interesting is that we had communities um, that were teenagers who posted about their experiences. And those communities of teenagers who posted about their experiences almost never engaged in posts related to either green or red, which kind of tells us a little bit, a little bit about how, how well our public health advocacy work um, and who we target with our public health advocacy as well. All right, so another example um, and one that we didn't quite use machine learning for, um, but um, we should. Ah, so question, I'm sorry I missed it. In, in what social platform were those community posts? They're all tweets from Twitter. Okay, um, so in this case, um, this is Reddit data. Um, so this is different from the Twitter data. But this is another study design that I wanted to show you that also tells us a bit, quite a bit about how belonging to a community becomes an important part of how misinformation can spread and how we think it might influence attitudes and beliefs um, sort of beyond what just what people talk about online. And so in this study, we looked at data from Reddit users. We sampled users who posted and commented in the conspiracy subreddit, and I'll just call that R conspiracy from now on, um, and for whom we were pretty confident were engaging in conspiratorial thinking in the conspiracy community because of how, how often and how much they um, engaged with the conspiracy subreddit. So in this study, we wanted to look at what makes these users different from other users in terms of the language they use and where they post. And so the problem is that there might be unmeasurable things about people who post in our conspiracy compared to sort of the average Reddit user in terms of things like age, gender, and topics of interest, and, you know, sort of um, how often they post, where they come from, so on. And we can't reliably estimate all of that information directly from a username and the content of what they post. So to deal with that, um, we used a, a matched pairs analysis. And so what we do is we go back six months before a user first posted in our conspiracy, and we create a timeline of all the posts and comments they made anywhere on Reddit. And we found other users who posted in the same first subreddit at around the same time, and then posted nearly as often as the user who went on to post in our conspiracy, but they never did. And so they had pathways in different directions. That way, we're comparing oranges with oranges, rather than trying to compare within a set of different oranges by sampling from sort of the entire fruit basket. And what we found was this really complicated set of differences uh, in the kinds of language that people used and the pathways through which they'd reach our conspiracy. And so in the example here on the bottom left, uh, this nice sort of visualization down here, um, this is a visualization that I sort of, I created and um, that shows how our, our conspiracy users at top in orange 
and how often uh, they jump from subreddit to subreddit on topics related to guns and gun rights. So the the, the study involved um, tens of thousands of, of different um, subreddits, um, but I just picked out the ones that are related to guns and gun rights compared to the other users on the bottom um, who were much less likely to follow that trajectory through to our conspiracy. And so while there were roughly equal numbers of users posting and commenting in archery and hunting, users who would eventually find their community in our conspiracy were much more likely to post and comment in things like guns are cool, AR-15, firearms, gun politics, and pro-gun, and often followed that trajectory through to our conspiracy. And there's lots of other examples of this um, in, the, in, um, in areas other than just in guns, but I just picked out this example because it it shows a nice sort of visualization of that. All right, so um, here's another example of work that we did in this area um, that definitely uses machine learning. Uh, this work predates the two studies with the, the, the conclusions that I think were kind of a little bit flawed, um, but unfortunately our work doesn't get anywhere near as many citations or news media articles because we don't really make any outlandish claims. And we don't obscure the data sampling or the methods to make it seem more important than it is. And this is an example from 2017, um, where we extracted two kinds of data from Twitter. And the first was every tweet that mentioned anything about HPV vaccines over a period of a couple of years. And the second was a random sample of around 50,000 active Twitter users who had enough information so that we could locate them at either the state or the county level in the United States. The key difference here was that we weren't sampling tweets and assuming that they represented a population's views because that's a really bad way of sampling tweets. We sampled users um, who were likely to be accounts of real people in real places and may or may not have ever posted anything about vaccination. All right, so we had this nice sample of about 50,000 people in the United States when you approximately where they lived. So the next step was to examine the accounts they followed and then use what was literally billions of follower connections to map out the kinds of tweets of people in each state in the United States were more likely to be exposed to. So we then used that unsupervised machine learning method I described before, topic modeling, um, to group the tweets into a set of about 30 different topics, the same as we did before. And then we use differences in topic exposure at the state level in a model of state level HPV vaccine coverage in teens. And so what we found was that states that had lower rates of HPV vaccine coverage were also the same states where vaccine critical topics, including a lot of misinformation, were heavily featured in the information diets, the information consumption of the Twitter users that we sampled from those states. We also showed um, that models that accounted for information exposure from Twitter um, were better at modeling vaccine coverage than models that only included things like um, insurance, um, education levels, income, and those sorts of things. So this is an ecological kind of study design where we compare population level measure with a population level measure from different from the same st from states. What we don't have is in a way to individually link measures. So we can't link an individual Twitter user um, to whether or not someone in their family or they got got a got HPV vaccine, for example. Obviously. But we use those as input to, to match those, those outcomes. This is obviously a limitation because we're constrained in the types of conclusions that we can draw. We can only really talk about correlations. Um, but it was kind of a huge amount of work. We had extremely large sets of data um, and we connected it to real world outcomes. This was a survey that was done um, to, to really accurately you know, measure um, HPV vaccine coverage in the United States. And I, so I think it should have been much more important than, the, than a study on bots and trolls on Twitter that don't measure outcomes or a Facebook study that doesn't measure outcomes that came later. Um, hopefully um, more studies in the future will copy these methods. And just between us, because there's not many of us here, um, as an aside, um, the methods that we introduced here in 2017 were absolutely used um, in a paper that was very prominently featured in the journal Science um, by David Laser's group, um, but unfortunately they didn't um, cite us. Um, Yanis, um, I'll come to that question at the end if that's okay, because um, we because we'll see if we can we can answer all of them at the end, um, and I'll go through a couple more studies there as well. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, the next one. So we didn't just do research that was aimed at trying to measure the size of the population and find out where and how things how things spread. 
we actually started to try and embark on developing tools and methods that we could try and use to sort of fix the problem. And so I started by calling these slides um, solutions. Um, and I'll explain, obviously they, they use AI, machine learning methods. Um, and the person who, who you haven't seen before on this slide is, is, um, is Zubair, um, Zubair Shah, who's, who's now an assistant professor in Qatar, um, was part of our group as well. So this particular example is one where we mined hundreds of thousands of web pages. Um, so not Twitter, not Reddit, but web pages um, that included information about vaccination. And so what, how we found those web pages was that we went through our list of all the links that were posted on Twitter about vaccination, um, not HPV vaccination, but vaccination in general, um, looked at those links and then tried to extract those web pages. And so then we took the text from all those web pages and then we use a form of machine learning, um, natural language processing, including um, sort of more modern NLP, which happens in, you know, uses, machine, uses neural networks and, and kind of um, those sorts of things, although they don't always work that well, um, to try and classify the, the web pages according to seven measures of credi credibility. And so we base those on some standard measures of, of um, credibility when presenting information in the media or to patients. And then we evaluated those classifiers to see how well they could predict the overall credibility score of a web page. And so the performance of those classifiers was pretty good. Um, and the idea would be that we could, we could, you know, let social media platforms use the classifiers for the web pages um, to flag links that were about to send people, us, you, all of us, um, to a, like a low credibility web page or, or a high credibility web page as a kind of form of pre-bunking. Um, Pre-bunking is where you warn people immediately before they see something to try and debunk the content so they're less likely to read it and accept it as a fact or, or potentially let it influence their attitudes and behaviours. So we never did manage to create or deploy the tool, but there is some excellent research happening elsewhere that shows that pre-bunking can be effective on social media. Um, and social media platforms are certainly flagging posts, but they just use keywords rather than looking at the content of the page they're, look, they're linking to. Okay, so quickly now, um, I wanna show you some of the work that we're doing now. Um, so I'm skipping over some of the additional work that we've done in the past, looking at the content messages in a, in a trial we published in pediatrics with Mareka. It's not related to AI or machine learning. But in this work, um, what we're wanting to do is to individually link social media data. So remember I told you about the problem where we couldn't individually link users from, who are from social media to their outcomes. But in this case, what we want to do is individually link social media data from people to proper measures of their health behaviors. I mean, this particular study where we, we've just started on a prototype or a, pro, a, a sort of a pilot study, um, we're looking at adherence to statins um, in a population of people who are at high cardiovascular risk and for whom statins would probably be prescribed. In this case, how do we collect social media data? Well, actually, we ask the participants to collect it for us. They install a smartphone app that lets them record any kind of relevant information they see on social media. When they're searching for it online, their friends, family, doctors, WhatsApp groups, wherever it is. We also ask them to tell us if they trust the information each time they record an instance of it in their daily lives. And we measure them over a period, you know, a period of month or two. The major advantages of this approach are firstly that we think it helps us capture more of the information that's important to people and the information they trust. But secondly, and most importantly, we can individually link the relevant information from social media or indeed anywhere they get a source of information to sort of validated questionnaires, survey instruments, or, or even to their medical records. So eventually we're going to use this information and machine learning methods to develop what we call localized risk signatures um, all around the world. Measures of the information environment that are associated with attitudes and behaviors that are sort of like not based in evidence and may lead to harm. Sources of misinformation in a lot of cases. The major limitations of this kind of approach are obviously the fact that we have to recruit people. So it means the studies are more expensive and they're smaller, but also that because we involve participants in the data collection, the process of involving them can actually influence how they interact with the information as well as their behaviors. So in our pilot studies, the, the statin one, and we use these smartphone, smartphone tools, and we discovered that participants were actually really keen to use the tools to support them in their healthcare journey. It's not, not good for us, right? They wanted to have control over the history so they could go back and look at the information later. They wanted to take it with them so they could show their doctor. And they really wanted to compare their level of trust in certain sources with information from experts or from their peers. Okay, so, um, so my team uh, is working with the World Health Organization at the moment. 
um, to build this around this smartphone app, a new kind of a toolkit for undertaking studies where we, you know, can capture um, what people are uh, reading or exposed to individually link them to health attitudes using validated questionnaires. And so we built this information diary platform, um, which helps researchers conduct high quality studies with these two kinds of tools. First one I showed you already. The second tool is a browser plugin that participants inst install and it sits quietly in the background and records the URLs and timing information anytime a user sees a page with a relevant keyword on it. Might be related to statins or cardiovascular risk or could just be in, related to vaccination or anything really. The platform is designed to sort of, sort of support rapid deployment and localization without people needing technical expertise and is suitable for resource poor settings. And we just make sure that they have proper ethics for approval and some assurances about the population sampling they do during recruitment. And I think the coolest bit about the platform is that study investigators using the tools can check a single box if they want their study to contribute de-identified data to a global meta-analysis, um, which is nice. Um, and obviously because the, the tools are capturing this very fine grained data about people's information exposure, it's likely there are many more factors than there are participants in any individual study. And that's an obvious signal that it's a good candidate for a machine learning approach that trains models to predict a person's health attitudes or behaviors based on what their information diet looks like. Okay, so very quickly now, as you have a look at this nice picture of um, the team that I lead at the University of Sydney, um, let me sort of quickly summarize what we've been through and offer up um, some solutions, I guess. So first solution would be, um, I think the solution to problems we have in AI-based research and misinformation um, can be solved by creating proper multidisciplinary teams where everybody actually works together and not in sort of tokenistic ways. Second, I think we have to be much tougher on doing data-driven and AI-based research in public health. Just because the data sets are there and we have the tools to build machine learning models and test out fancy new algorithms and doesn't mean we need to do it. Instead, I think we need to ensure that AI-based research in public health is driven by public health problems. And we do this kind of thing with clinically led research in medical informatics and medical science all the time. And I don't think public health should be any different. Uh, third one, um, I think some of the approaches that I showed you today um, can be used to generate reliable, albeit careful conclusions if they're used properly and if those questions are driven by public health. The challenge, of course, is in building expertise and sort of the capacity that we need um, in people who can com effectively communicate across those divides. Um, so um, very quickly, Biomedical Informatics and Digital Health, there's about 60 of us in total, if you count the 50 um, sort of academics, postdocs, PhD students, and the 10 or so extra affiliate people we have from local health districts and from um, industry. Um, and uh, hopefully we're building these kinds of capacity and expertise in the area because we have things like the Master of Digital Health and Data Science, which we run jointly between uh, my department and, and engineering at the University of Sydney. And um, we also run conferences and hopefully that's going to help a little bit um, uh, mostly across health informatics and, and digital health. But if I have my way, hopefully a little bit in public health as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Adam. Um, any questions? There was definitely one um, question earlier and I can probably try and attempt to answer that one yep. now, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, Jana said, how can we talk about misinformation when the actual data about the efficacy after effects of the HPV vaccines have not, not been produced yet? Um, you know, that's the funny thing. So right at the start, when I talked about misinformation, I said, you know, um, misinformation isn't always misinformation um, at, at all the time. Often uh, information that we know about changes over time. Um, for example, there were conspiracy theories about... Um, about um, people being misused in medical treatments in the United States um, just because of their ethnicity or their race. Um, turned out it was true. Um, that wasn't, that wasn't, it was a conspiracy theory and then it just became a conspiracy um, and it was true. You know, evidence changes over time. So, you know, very, uh, the, the first evidence that hydroxychloroquine works in COVID-19, maybe it came out true. M maybe that was the best evidence we had at the time. And we discovered later it wasn't. Um, Tammy flu, the best evidence uh, we had at the time. No, 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 was... no, 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 no. We didn't. The Columbia study, which uh, was the study that advocated against the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, had a fundamental flaw that they administered the hydroxychloroquine 
after very late after intubation. That's a fundamental flaw. Okay, mm -hmm. so the misinformation was on the Columbia study, not on those that promoted the efficacy of, of uh, hydroxychloroquine if administered at the proper time. So mm. that's why well, that's why I raised the question of what we label as misinformation is really dubious. And yeah, I look, should, I, I, we should, we should what I can say is I, I don't quite know. I don't quite know the evidence for hydroxychloroquine well enough. I didn't didn't really follow uh -huh. along. I mean, I know there were certainly studies um, done in, in France and, and Australia. I don't don't know about the Colombian one. Um, right. I know there was also a study that was sort of briefly published from a from a doctor in, in New York as well. Um, so I don't I don't quite know the evidence of that. Um, it is it's an interesting area. Um, and look, you know, evidence may continue to change over time as we discover more and more. And, you know, certainly drugs have been right. um, um, removed from the market after a period of like 10 years because we we didn't know about whether they were safe or effective. So but that's not really related to um, to the use of AI during the pandemic, though. So let's let's move on to the next question, because otherwise we'll quickly run out of time. Um, so from Ollie, yeah. Yeah, so um, so there was one from Ollie. Yeah, um, so the question is, uh, shocking ML method sections in molecular biology, bioinformatics. Yeah, do you think the same factors are driving this across fields, um, or do you think there are extra factors when it comes to pub public city fields like public health? Um, um, forgive me for this view. I think I'm entitled to it because I'm from computer science. Um, the the things that are required for career progression in computer science are often to improve the technical um, performance of, of algorithms um, and to come up with new algorithms that, that work really well and to publish in conferences. And where the data come from um, is kind of not so important and, and not, so, not so useful for career progression in computer science, which is a bit of a shame. Um, however, I think the world is changing and I think computer science is changing for the better. And as three examples of that, there's been an, an increased focus. So obviously generalization and transportability are really important for AI and machine learning have been for a long time. Um, but we've also now started to look at things like um, um, explainability and interpretability. And that gets us much closer to things that are going to be useful in the real world. And we've now moved on even further and main, some of the you know, most prestigious conferences now have sections on fairness and equity in AI. And I think that gets us closer and closer and closer to um, the kind of work that we need to do in computer science and AI and data science generally um, that helps us sort of um, solve these problems. And so while there has been a culture of, well, we don't really care about the data, we only care about the algorithm um, and novelty of it, there's now increased focus on things that are really important for um, the applied domain. Um, so I think that's a that's a, something that is uh, that I'm optimistic about, um, um, and not just in public health, but also potentially in biology and biomedical informatics as well, or bioinformatics as well. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, I might just um, yes. jump in if I can. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. That was um, super interesting. Um, and and now I don't quite know what to which point I want to pick up because there's <laughs> there's many things there. So I'm a computer scientist. I'm an AI researcher, machine learning researcher, and I agree with m mostly everything you just said. Um, you know that it it's true that ML and AI is you know people are working well talking about ethics and transparency and explainability etc cetera, etc cetera. at the same time i feel like computer scientists are or we actually don't know what we're doing with these problems like we need we need ethicists and philosophers and many other people to help which just comes back to to um to support your overall point i think that interdisciplinary research is really important here um, it's it's super important in ai um, because AI is starting to um, come to, to have to deal with all these issues that that um, computer scientists are not the people to like we don't know what we're doing um, yeah so maybe just a quick I, I wanted to sort of ask you what you thought about the potential for things like you know you have all this um, stuff in AI around um, generation of synthetic images, generation of, of text, um, of code, 
um, potential for probably for people to um, spread misinformation by faking scientific studies and faking scientific results in ways that look increasingly more and more plausible and realistic um, kind of scares the crap out of me. But what do you reckon? Uh, we, we, we've done this. So, so my other area of research is in uh, clinical epidemiology. Um, and one of the things we try to do is predict things about clinical trials. Um, and so what we did was we, you know, tried to build a model of what a clinical trial report looks like based on its registration. And so we can take a registration of a clinical trial and produce a fake version of the results. And the best we got to was like, you know, um, people aged between 61 and 59, you know what I mean? Like the numbers don't make sense because it couldn't interpret it and then re reevaluate it. And it was just mimicking things that happened in there. Um, so, so, you know, I'm, I'm not actually, so the, the thing about misinformation in particular, and I'm just pick on misinformation because it's the, you know, the, the, the topic, um, you know, the source of these things doesn't always matter. Um, but they have to travel through trusted um, trusted communities or trusted networks. It's the only way that we can we can it it can mm, take hold and and create harm in a way. And so I think um, no matter there's always going to be sources of misinformation forever. But the one thing we can change and we can study and we can fix is those networks and those communities. And I think we can build those tools and kinds of solutions to try and fix that. The most important one, obviously, um, is early education of critical appraisal. So people don't feel like that. That doesn't solve the community problem, but it certainly might help to go some of the way. Um, I think those solutions and tools that we built um, have, have, a, have opportunities in the future. I think um, um, I, I, I just don't think you can attempt to regulate AI um, to avoid these things happening it'd be nearly impossible. So let's not try and regulate what people are allowed to do and say, let's try and just make everyone a little bit smarter about critically appraising what, they, what they're exposed to. Um, I wish I had a better solution for it, but I think that's the best we've got. Thanks. Anyone else have a question? Uh, I have a question on the explainability aspect mm -hmm. of, of the research. And I'm really curious if you find good correlation. I mean, you study behavior, but behavior doesn't always represent what's like the, 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 the mental state of yep. the person you are researching. And yep. then, of course, the, the issue if they are real persons, if they are fake, if they are constructed and manufactured, okay? Yeah, so yeah. We have uh, lots of issues there. Now, can you find correlation? Can you predict what is the mental state of the person you are studying? And can you predict how it's going to change based on the constant input, information and misinformation that they may be receiving across? Is that possible? Yeah, short, short answer is no, we can't. Um, and the two answers to the question are, um, you know, what we what we can measure about people um, in terms of what they post online, um, even what we can measure about people if we stick electrodes on their head um, is not necessarily going to be an exact representation of their of their mental state at all. Um, you know, what people post online is certainly not um, um, uh, digging into their brain in a sense, because a lot of that is, tends to be performative anyway. Um, what the, the solution to the problem, of course, would be to, um, to look at their actions later on and identify correlations. It does has nothing to do with the explainability. And the second answer is that um, the issue with explainability, um, and um, I, I don't remember the paper now, um, but what they showed was that you can certainly build multiple models um, of machine learning. Thanks, Julia. Um, what you can certainly build um, multiple models uh, that are different, that produce exactly the same technical performance, um, but look at other completely different sets of features and, and pay attention to, diff to completely different sets of features. So things like um, attention, which is what we often use to think of for in relation to explainability, but not interpretability, um, uh, doesn't always give us the results that we want. So even if, even if explainability was a, was a perfect thing, um, we wouldn't be able to do it and it's not a perfect thing. So we can't do it anyway. So the short answer on both of those, for both of those reasons is no and no.
All right. Um, I think we are. Okay. There was a follow up question from Oli. This is the last question we, we can take because of time. Um, so I'll read. Um, no, no, no I, I can read it. Um, and look, um, if everybody has to leave early, because I know we were meant to finish at, um, at 11.45, but I can I can answer the question because yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay yeah. until, until 12. Sorry, I should say whatever the time is for you guys. <laughs> um, um, the flip side of increasing accessibility is that it's easy for these tools to be used without the expertise to understand them. Um, yeah. Uh, Ollie. Unfortunately, a great question. Um, and it reminds me of a paper, you can actually look it up by a guy named Claude Shannon. Um, so for the computer scientists in the room, you might know who Claude Shannon is, um, who um, wrote a paper called The Bandwagon or something like that um, on one page. Um, and uh, his complaint was um, that um, uh, people were using his ideas about um, information theory um, across a whole bunch of other disciplines and they were adopting them in ways that were just an analogies rather than actually trying to use them properly um, and I always I had it used to have this paper pinned up on my on my board because it was a constant source of frustration that um, I used to work in complex systems and and um, and, and read physics papers um, and then a whole bunch of people decided they were experts in complex systems and complex adaptive systems but they really were just using the words but they weren't actually using the theory or the equations um, and it annoyed the hell out of me. But these days I'm much more relaxed about it. Um, and I think that um, the people who build the tools probably have to be extremely careful about it. And this kind of relates to the work that we're doing with the, with the misinformation, with the tools that we use for information diaries. Um, we want to make the protocols of those tools built into the platform so that it's Im nearly impossible to do the study badly and to produce bad results. And we require that we need them to produce good results and good data because we want to do this kind of massive global scale um, um, meta analysis of information that people are exposed to around the world and the differences in the information people are exposed to around the world and whether or not that has associations with with attitudes and potential behaviors. So, for example, we want to find out whether people who mostly use WhatsApp instead of Facebook or, or Twitter instead of Reddit or whatever it might be, you know, they go and see their doctor much more often or they talk to their parents instead, you know, whether those things make differences in um, and, and whether or not we can target those with interventions to improve them. So if people are um, more likely to have harmful attitudes because they go and talk to their, um, you know, friends and religious leaders, then, well, that's great. We can develop interventions that support evidence-based um, um, decision-making um, through religious leaders, for example. And that's a really common way to do things in some countries as well. Um, and, and, you know, that's the tool builder's responsibility to, um, to try and make sure that the, the tools are being used appropriately. Problem with AI is we've got a lot of tools that make it easy to press buttons. Thank you very much. Um, um, I don't, uh, Giannis, I don't have really good examples of papers on explainability and interpretability. Um, I think it's just sort of like lots of papers stuck together in my head. Um, so yeah, sorry, I, I, I wouldn't know. Um, and probably I'd delegate to a PhD student or something. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Um, all right, um, let's thank Adam for this great talk. And then it's, it's good to have you in this seminar series. Um, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for participating. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks.